Welcome to another in the Lindemann Engineering series of semi-useful, hopefully helpful videos about motorcycle stuff. My name is Ed Sorbo, owner of Lindemann Engineering. In case you don't know, Lindemann Engineering specializes in motorcycle suspension work and our specialty of specialties is we work with your stock stuff, your stock fork, your stock shock. We respring, revalve, rebuild that stuff. You don't have to buy aftermarket, we can sell you aftermarket, but we can give you the spring rate, the preload, and the valving for any situation. So today's video is about setting up your shop. And why am I qualified to do this? So I did my first shop work when I was the lot boy uh, at a shop in Hawaii, a dealership. And I organized a little space that they gave me to work in. And I organized the parts room where all the stuff that got taken off motorcycles and supposed to be given back to the customer, but was just kept. I organized all of that stuff. Uh, and you know, that just kind of evolved into opening my uh, first shop and modifying that space to work for us. That was Sport by Kauai. Um, and then Sport by Kauai moved to a new location and then moved again. And each of those processes, we learned something. The most useful thing that I learned was when we made the first move. So we, we bought wheels, we, Mike Kaufman and I, bought wheels kind of away from Gary Kiesel a long time ago uh, in Hawaii, and we turned it into Sport by Kauai. And then we moved to the other side of the island, uh, Koapaka Street, and we had a much bigger location where I went there when we were you know, negotiating to get the space, and measured everything and I made a drawing, scale drawing, of the floor space. And then I made cutouts of the equipment and the toolboxes and stuff that we had, uh, tables and whatnot, and moved them around on the floor space. So we knew when it was time to move, where we were going to put the dyno, where we were going to put the shelves, etc, etc. And the moving process got a bunch of friends together with pickup trucks and we did it all in one day. And so that's the first place that I think that you should start. Whatever your space is, go get some grid paper, graph paper, and make a drawing of the walls and whatnot, and then make scale cutouts of your stuff, like the motorcycle table, if you have a lift table that you're going to work on, or the size of your toolbox and your table or workbench that you have, and play with that stuff and move it around because it's a lot easier to move a little piece of paper than it is to put your thing here and then go, if that doesn't work, I don't have enough space to walk between these three things, or whatever. So that's your starting place and that gets you thinking, but it's not carved in stone. By the way, I forgot to introduce my helper, Tony Serra, behind the camera, and Nash Dog is in charge of the tennis ball right now. Um, so making a drawing and thinking about it and sleeping on it. So you know, you think about it for a week or so, you wake up in the morning, you got this new great idea, and then you give it a try. So that's your starting place. Beyond that, I'm not going to try to tell you that your toolbox needs to go here, and your solvent tank needs to go there, and whatever. But I'm going to talk about sections, workstations that you need, concepts. For example, you can see in the background that I have all my stuff in boxes. And for me, that's what works really well. And I can put things in one category in that box, and then that box can move into the trailer when I go to the event and come back on the shelf when I'm back in the shelf. Um, and then I'm out here in the Coachella Valley and it's kind of dusty, so I don't have platform shelves, I have wire so that I don't have dust buildup. Just easier to keep things clean. Plus these shelves right now are easy to get at home repair, or home improvement places. Um, and so that's the format that I use. You can use any format you want, the idea is to think about all the constraints that you have in advance and plan for it. And then, another caveat, you don't have to finish it at one time, right? In the example I gave with Sport by Kauai, we moved an existing shop into another location where we knew it was going to go and we had all this stuff and we needed to be able to do work on the first day when we opened, right? So we moved on Sunday and we were open for business on Monday, but you don't have that requirement. And as an example here, I'm now working out of a two-car plus garage in a subdivision in a secret location in the Coachella Valley uh, and I had to move in in stages uh, so I have temporary lighting set up right now uh, that was a vast improvement over what was here but it's not all the way to my final end and I did that and I got some work done and then you know I'm, I'm making an evolutionary process the same thing with my trailer when I got my first trailer I went on my first trip with no shelves nothing 
right? Just tie down stations to put the bike in and toolbox in. And then I walked around the pits and looked in everybody else's trailers. I love to do that on Facebook. Whenever people put up pictures of their motorcycle that they're working on, I'm not looking at the motorcycle. I'm looking at this around it and at the shop stuff for ideas that I can copy. Um, so it's an evolutionary process. You don't have to do it all at once. If you can do it all at once, if you're buying a new house and you're going to move in, paint the floor first. Get that out of the way because moving stuff off the floor to another part so that you can paint that part of the floor and then move shit back on the painted part to paint the next part of the floor, which is what's going on here, is not as convenient as just painting it all once and being done with it. And the biggest single improvement you can make for your shop space is going to be sealing and painting the floor. Get the two-part epoxy shop paint, scrub the shop really well first, degreaser, soap on a brush, I use a big push broom and a hose to rinse everything out and clean it as thoroughly as you can. And then you paint the epoxy and then you throw down the chips. The chips give you better traction on the floor and they hide imperfections in the floor, the little flakes. And you want to put down more than you think you need because it takes more of that when you're tossing it out. Uh, if, you, if you put what you think you need, it's not going to look like enough when you're all done. So you do a section, maybe 10 feet square, you toss out the flakes, you move to your next section. After that dries slash hardens, then you put the clear coat over it. At a minimum, you clear coat your floor. They sell the clear coat at home improvement places in a gallon jug, and one gallon jug will coat a shop of this size, a two car garage, like six times. And it's, I don't know, 15, 30 bucks for a gallon that you can't miss. But what I prefer is the gray epoxy with the flakes um, and then the clear coat over top of that. And then if I need to, I can touch up a spot in the future or five years from now, I, I can redo the whole thing and I can do it in sections because the flakes hide any differences. Okay? Um, so that's the first thing. That's the, whenever I moved into a new place, uh, when I bought my first house and, and I moved in, I did the floor first and I was really happy that I did that and then the other stuff later on, if you can. Okay, what's the first thing that you need to do when you come back from a race weekend? No, you need to wash your motorcycle. After every weekend at the track or every event, wash the motorcycle. Garden hose, spray nozzle, soap, elbow grease, the whole bit. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to have a clean motorcycle. I know some people like the idea of you know having a thing that looks like shit and kicking everybody else's ass, but you will have more problems if your equipment is dirty. And you will never find a championship winning motorcycle, and you will never find a spacecraft that goes to Mars successfully that's dirty. So I come home and I unload and I wash the motorcycle. It can be outside in the driveway. All you need is a garden hose close by, right? And I like to put the bike up on the front and the rear stands so I can spin the wheels and clean everything thoroughly. This is, you know, outside here at my house. It's a little corner uh, in, in the shape of the house and a storage shed. And I have set up a little wash station with some leftover plastic shelves that I'm using as a table. And I've got a garden hose right there so I can quickly and easily wash small parts. Now, most of the time, this is for Lindemann Engineering stuff. People send their forks in the shock, and they always get to me dirty. I don't, I don't get it, but whatever. And I need to wash them before I work on them, and then I need to wash them when I'm done, before they go back. So this is what I set up. You can make it out of scrap wood. It's a really great thing to have. This can be also the place where you wash the motorcycle, if it's more convenient, whatever. And then this happens to be my old school uh, human-powered tire changer, which I fortunately don't have to use very often. Um, so, super important to keep your motorcycle clean. Think about a place where you want to be able to do it. You know, all you need is a bucket and a scrub brush and a hose. Okay, probably the first thing that you want to think about for the shop layout is where I'm going to work on the motorcycle. That probably doesn't change depending on whether or not you're working on the floor or you have a table that you built for yourself 
that you have a ramp to get the bike onto, or you've got a lift table of some kind. And while we're talking about lift tables, I chose the Harbor Freight version because it has the foot pump. I don't like having a hose that I have to walk over all the time for air or whatever to run the thing up and down. And um, you know, I'm not going up and down constantly like somebody at a dealership might. Um, you can see in the background we got a, a refrigerator, a washer dryer, a water heater. These are things that are in the shop in the two car garage that you don't have any control over. They have to be in here and maybe you can move them a few inches this way or that way which is what I did here uh, to get a little bit more space on the other end. Uh, and that goes into my earlier drawing in areas I can't change anything. In the case of this shop, there's the lower space for the two cars and then there's a step up for all the rest of the stuff. So that made it kind of easy, right? And that's where the outlets for the, uh, the plumbing was anyway. Okay, so then I could basically put the motorcycle here or there. Which side of the shop is it going to be on? Another consideration you might have is maybe the car has to be parked in here most of the time. Uh, maybe both of them have to be parked in here. Are you moving the car out and then setting up the workspace? In which case having a lift table is probably not very practical. Uh, and you can also see that I've got carpet runner on the floor because I haven't finished painting. Also because it's a little bit uh, reducing uh, fatigue if I'm on my feet for a long time. And if I drop something, it's less likely to get damaged because it lands on the carpet. Uh, and it doesn't chip the floor if it's something big and heavy. Uh, this stuff, again, at a, at a home improvement place, it comes in a long roll. It's pretty inexpensive. And you can wash it with soap and water outside and a push broom as a scrubber. And so they last quite a long time. Um, so I've got a long runner up there under the camera, which is my, uh, you know, working area. And then I've got runners on either side of the motorcycle for whichever side I'm on. Um, so think about those things. Think about what your parameters are and decide what equipment you want to get and what kind of equipment you don't want and where you want to put the thing. Uh, I used to have a table that I made out of 2 by 4s and plywood with a ramp. The thing to be aware of on that is that the table will run away from you as you start pushing up the ramp. So you might need a way of securing it, maybe tie downs to hold it from sliding, which was a pain in the ass. Uh, and of course, you've got to have the space for the ramp to get up and enough speed to get up if you're not running or uh, driving the bike up under its own power. And so if you're going to go for a work table, one of these that goes up and down on its own is a lot more convenient. Okay, lighting. Lighting is super critical. Working in a dark space and you can't see very well is just a disaster, a recipe for disaster. So the current lighting that I have in here now, uh, LEDs, of course, is the way to go. Uh, and I got these uh, four-foot hanging LEDs from Amazon. It was really easy. Like I mentioned earlier, lighting is not finished in this shop and it was a giant improvement of, over what was there. It had these old school light bulb sockets and I got the little screw in plugs and then I just plugged into that so I didn't have to do any wiring. I just improved the lighting enough to be able to work. The single biggest problem I have right now that has to be improved is that I have my four foot lights going across the motorcycle, which is what I want, but they're not long enough to get light in from both sides. And what I've used in the past that was successful on that is eight foot fluorescence. Um, and so I could do, you know, two more four-foot LEDs or maybe I can get eight-foot LEDs or whatever. Maybe I'll try hanging these on the two sides this way and see if that works well enough. But you're generally working at the bike from the side and that's the way you need the best light. And you also want to think a little bit about shadows. The way to avoid shadows is to have enough long light structures that the shadows are eliminated that way. If you have just a spotlight sitting here shining on the bike and you're trying to work on it, well that's okay in the pits, you know, one night or something like that, but it's not, it's not conducive to good work in a shop. Clean motorcycle, clean shop, well lit are the foundations of doing good work. And don't be afraid to, to try different stuff. If you go the way I did with these hanging lights, it's really easy to move the hooks around and try different stuff. And LED costs a little bit more initially, but it's way cheaper and way more reliable. Uh, fluorescence, you know, you've got to buy bulbs and ballasts all the time. So I would tell you to embrace the LED world 
and, and give your shot more lighting than you think you're going to need. You will not be in there going, damn it, I can't stand the fact that I can see what I'm working on so well. That will never happen. Just like you cannot have enough motorcycles, you can also never have too many tools. And once you have more than two tools, you need a toolbox. There are a million options. And just like the shop layout, you're going to want to pick the thing that works for you. You don't have to pick any certain thing because I did. But a couple of things that I would highly recommend, and what I like the best, is I like the roll around toolbox bottoms, not the upper stack, because I use the top of the toolbox as a table. My goal is to only put tools on top of here, but sometimes this is my workstation where I'm taking my race notes after a practice or a race session uh, because it's a convenient place to stand, and sometimes it's where I eat my lunch, although I try to never spill my soda on top of my toolbox because then it drips down into all the tools, right? The box layout itself, what I want is as many thin, short drawers as possible. Not the big, deep drawers, because things end up being stacked on top of each other down there, and you always need the thing that's underneath. Whereas the short drawers, the stuff you need is spread out, and it's right there. Now, you may only have a small hand-carried toolbox for now, and I've got a suggestion for that, no problem. So for now we are here. This is the second toolbox roll around that I ever had. The first one was one of these with uh, more of the larger drawers and less of the small ones and then a stacked box on top. I bought that used from a mechanic at the shop where I was working when he bought a new bigger toolbox. And that leads me to a strong point about toolboxes. Just like used motorcycles. You're going to be able to sell them in the future when you're ready for a newer, bigger, better, whatever. And you're not going to end up losing very much money. You're going to get value from the toolbox while you have it, just like you get value from the motorcycle while you race it. And then you're going to sell it for close to what you paid for it to a new person who's going to be happy and is going to love it for a while before they sell it to the next person. So don't be afraid to spend an extra 50 or 100 bucks on your toolbox to get the thing that really works for you. Now this one you can see I have a foldable uh, side space uh, shelf that gave me more space so it took up less space in the trailer when I was traveling to events because that could fold down and they gave me a bunch more space when I was at the event. Here is a little uh, shelf that used to hang on the back side of this toolbox for spray bottles of stuff and whatnot that increased my space and now it has a new location here on the side of this shelf. That kind of stuff is always useful. You can get those magnetic bowls uh, for putting things in. You can get magnetic holders for your roll of shop towels, although when you use that outside at a racetrack, they tend to unwind in the wind. <laughs> um, you can get hanging racks for your tea handles, which are super nice to have, and you can hang them on the side of your toolbox. There's a lot of things that you can do to increase the space of the toolbox. So don't be afraid to start with the smaller size. The beauty is that they roll around and this is what I like to do. Whether I'm working on cars or motorcycle, I roll the toolbox up to close to the place I'm working. On the corner of the car, the front, the back, whatever. And then it's tools, work. Tools, work. And I'm not walking back and forth. And if you're doing this all day long, or even just on a, on a short job, it's three steps to your toolbox and three steps back. That's six steps times every single time you need to go back and forth. And that can add up to a significant amount of time. Just like when you want to pick your pit spot at the racetrack. If you don't have a motorhome and you've got to walk all the way over there to go to the bathroom every time you want to go to the bathroom, it starts to add up. Okay? And so the toolbox on wheels gives you way more flexibility in your shop layout. It makes it easier for it to move it out of the way. The car's got to come back in. It lets you put the toolbox over here when you're doing that and the toolbox over there when you're doing the other thing. Okay, so that's the overall concept for me. The tools I'm not using go on here. I can only work with two tools at one time, max, and that's all that's on the, on the bike, lift table or next to the bike on the floor or whatever. All the other tools I'm using for the job 
can stay on top. Once that job is done, all those tools get put away and then the next set of tools. So I need four tools for whatever I'm doing now. Those get put away and now I need six other tools for the next thing that I'm doing and I do that. Otherwise you end up with every tool you have all over the place and pretty soon you're liking the button on the Facebook post where the person is talking about why can I never find my 10 millimeter socket? I never lose my 10 millimeter socket because I always put it back here and when I'm done with it I put it in the box where it belongs. Okay? Toolbox number two, this is my motorcycle toolbox. I actually have another one just like that that's another complete set of tools for cars. It turns out you need smaller tools when working on cars than on motorcycles because on a motorcycle you're generally, you're always on the outside of the thing. Whereas in a car you're always reaching down in the dark places you can't see and the tools need to be physically smaller just to fit into that space. So again you'll see that I've got as many shallow drawers as possible and then I've got the tools laid out in a way that works for me. Biggest problem I have is that I have to now drive over a curve to get the motor, the motor home in and out. And so a lot of tools bounce out even though I go really, really slow. Uh, so I have ways of stacking the toolboxes, the tools to deal with that. Uh, and that'll depend on your toolbox and your application, how much shuffling goes on. Um, and this shop layout is not perfect for me because I can't put the toolbox far enough away from the motorcycle to be completely out of the way. It had, the only place I had was here next to the shelves. And it's not worth moving it two feet closer to where I'm working. And I don't have enough space to put it on the front or the back. So I do have one extra step constantly. But when I'm working on suspension stuff, I roll it over there to be across from my suspension table. And then I just turn around for my tools and turn around for my work. So that's the best compromise that I could come up with. Toolbox number three in my current setup. This black toolbox is the Lindemann Engineering Specialty Tools box. And this little red hanging toolbox is from a long time ago. And what it was originally purchased for was to put delicate measuring instruments in so that they wouldn't be getting banged around when I was going in and out of my normal toolbox. Uh, since then it's evolved into like leftovers and weird stuff because uh, I, have, I have plenty of space inside here. Harbor Freight sells this toolbox in the deep version and a shallower version. This is the deeper version. This toolbox doesn't move. It's located right next to my suspension station and it's easy go-to for specialty tools for when I'm working here that I would never need at the racetrack. Um, and then next to it I have a uh, display station, uh, Lucas Oils, I'm a dealer, and this is a promotional item that you can get for, that I can get for free. And so this is the miscellaneous universal put it there because I don't know where else to put it. I'm kind of in the middle of that project, I need to store it for a week or whatever kind of thing. And kind of like a miscellaneous junk drawer in your, in your uh, kitchen, you need something like this. Uh, from time to time. And it's on wheels so I can move it out of the way and whatnot. Nash Dog is going after the ball again. Um, so the compromise, you probably started out with a small toolbox that's like a chest that you can carry around. My first version of that had drawers on the bottom and then the sockets and stuff on the top. Um, and I'm suggesting that you have it on something that can roll around. Harbor Freight, Lowe's, Home Depot, whatever, there's various kinds of uh, shelves on wheels. You could build one out of scrap wood and some casters, and you could put that toolbox on top of that, and then you'd have a place underneath to store larger things. And that can be a stepping stone between your first toolbox and your first roll around. Uh, and you can see if it really works for you or if it doesn't. The thing that I caution against is the really tall toolbox that you can't see into the top of. Unless you're six, six foot, most motorcycle racer people are, are not super tall. Uh, so that's why I like the shorter boxes as well as having the space to put things on top of, most specifically tools. Okay, shelving and storage. Now I previously mentioned that I like the box system and you can see that I've got the boxes labeled. So track box and track supply 
and SV track box. What that means is those boxes go to the track with me when I go to a track event. And in a perfect world, they could stay in the trailer. But the summer out here is so hot that I don't want to leave stuff out in the trailer. So they come inside and then they go back. And it's a little bit inconvenient, but it's not the end of the world. Um, and track supplies just means what it means to me. Things that I've learned that I want to have at the track. Uh, crazy glue, silicone, extra fuel line, some extra grip, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's going to be different for you. SV track box is the stuff specific to the current race bike, which is the SV. Um, and then the shelving, so this one here is in the middle of the shop floor space. Up against the wall back there, I have shelves touching the wall. You can access them from one side. Then there's an aisleway, and then this big set of shelves that you can take boxes on and off from both sides, right? Like the aisles in a library. And what I do to get more shelving space is that I don't put a shelf on the floor, right? So the really heavy things are on the floor itself underneath the shelves. And then the height of these are set for the different box sizes. So there's the short boxes and the deep boxes, right? And the obvious difference is you get so much stuff in the big box that you're digging down to the bottom all the time and that's a pain in the ass. Or the stuff gets too heavy, right? So heavier things go into the smaller boxes uh, and lighter, bigger, bulkier things go into the big boxes. The clear ones are nice because you can kind of get a clue what's inside, but the clear plastic breaks easier than the super heavy duty uh, colored ones. So, you know, your preference. The foldable lids are convenient, but the solid lids don't let anything fall inside, right? There's no dust and stuff getting in there. And then that's the other reason why I choose the box method. Those things that are in the box are clean all the time uh, and I don't have to worry about it. The downside to the box method is that box takes up the same space, whether it's full to the top or I've got one thing in there. So, you know, it's an efficiency thing. But a whole bunch of different cardboard boxes don't stack neatly. It's not easy to keep track of them. Uh, it just never worked out, you know, so well for me. And that leads to a little segue here. What should you keep and how long should you keep it? It's really easy to think, you know, I can sell that Honda Hurricane ECU for $400, so I should keep it. Yeah, well, except that people can get Honda ECUs for hurricanes if they want them, since they never broke, you know, for $5, and you're effectively paying, you're paying yourself, but it's costing you to keep stuff because you can't use that space for something else, or because you have to move it 400 times, so you want to think about the real likelihood of selling the thing in the future and the cost to you of keeping it until it's time to sell it because you're probably going to just end up throwing it away in the future in which case you'd have been better off throwing it away now and I understand that it's in our DNA it is in your brainstem to eat the apple rather than to throw the apple away because we were hunter-gatherers okay but you're not a hunter-gatherer anymore and it's not an apple it's a useless piece of shit from some stupid motorcycle that you shouldn't have bought in the first place just put it in the recycle bin and let it turn into something else or give it to some guy who's got the same kind of bike at a track day and make somebody else happy and declutter your life you will be happier for it okay so we're in the corner up against the far wall of the current location of Lindemann Engineering and this wall incorporates some of the stuff from the household that has to have a place to be. Um, you can't just chuck everything outside on the patio. So we've got uh, oxyacetylene welding tank, we've got extra nitrogen tanks, got a fire extinguisher that's been converted to use water. So challenge me to a squirt gun fight someday. <laughs> uh, above that we have a little custom shelf that I made to stack up all of these tools that come in the nice plastic uh, boxes and I had a left I had leftover shelf material and I had those brackets for them and I put the bar there for the hangers just because I had it even though I don't have anything to hang there ladders had to be stored somewhere different sizes are of course are great to have I got a motorhome so I've got a creeper and then we've got these nice small gray shelves which are a pain in the ass to build but because you gotta screw them together but they're cheap and they're light and they're easy to move around while they're empty and in my case they fit exactly shock springs, fork springs, 
uh, and little miscellaneous Lindemann engineering parts. Uh, to the left of that, we got those silly plastic uh, drawer things, which are kind of a pain in the ass, but there's a lot of Lindemann small stuff, like every size O-ring that you can imagine, and those are a great way to store them. I used to have them screwed to a wall, but I don't have enough wall space here, so they're set up on there. Again, using those metal shelves where I can choose the height of the shelves. They're pretty inexpensive. They're easy to keep clean. And then you see miscellaneous stuff stacked all the way to the ceiling. Some of my riding gear is out right now because I've been riding my trail bike. Normally it doesn't live there, but this aisle way I talked about is a useful place to put things temporarily, like if my race bike needs to come off the table so a customer bike can go over there, it sits in here if I don't want to do the hassle of putting it into my trailer. Uh, so once again, the point is nothing's carved in stone. Tweak it and adjust it to fit your situation. But almost anything that you plan and think through is going to be better than just showing up and starting to work on the bike and there's shit in your way all the time that you've constantly got to move. This is a really cool piece of Lindemann engineering equipment. It was actually one of the things that Jim Lindemann had that I moved down here from his location. It's a bandsaw, but the point for our thing is it's on wheels. And that allows me to store it in some out of the way place and then move it to a work area somewhere convenient when I'm actually using it because I don't use it that often. And that's why the big orange 20 ton press is on a dolly with wheels. So I can move it out of the way when I don't use it and bring it to wherever I'm working when I am using it. And that's a great way to, to maximize your storage space because you need some space around this thing when you want to work with it, but you don't want to have that dedicated to it when you're not using it. So having it on wheels is a good way to, to optimize your floor space. And then once it's parked, I uh, have a dust cover to keep it clean. And these are drop cloths for painting. Uh, and then I just cut them to the size that I need. And that's what I cover with motorcycles with. And that's what I cover equipment with to keep it clean. And in my case, right, when the, if the garage door is open, people might see what's in here. So I like to keep things covered up and hidden. If we look up that way, you'll see that I've got shelves hanging from the ceiling. Another great place for mostly household stuff that's up and out of the way uh, and clears up floor space because floor space is the most valuable thing. Okay, now we're on the workstation side of the shop. And I want you to think about work in two categories, clean work and dirty work. So when you're drilling holes in your bolts for a safety wire, that's dirty work. And when you're working on your carburetors, that's clean work. So you want a clean station and a dirty station. In the super fancy setup, you have a clean room and a dirty room, right? Uh, so I have a clean workstation, which doubles as my Lindemann workspace. So when I'm doing forks and shocks, I'm here. If I'm working on carburetors, I'm also here. And over there, I have a dirty station where I do drilling and cutting and grinding and welding. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, I've got a rubber pad over my steel tabletop for when I'm working on delicate stuff that I don't want to get beat up and I don't want to make a lot of noise. Um, over here, I have a solvent tank, which, you know, a normal house shop, you're not going to have that. Um, but you're going to want to have a place to clean things and scrub things. And so a deep laundry sink. Uh, works really well for that. You'll notice the yellow bucket down here. It's just a five gallon bucket. I use it for trash, but I use the small buckets and I have three of them around the shop. Again, saving steps every time I need to go and put something into the trash, it's close by. And it saves floor space because a big full size trash can takes up a lot of space where these can fit in the little cubbies that you're not really using. And then over at the end of the hallway there, I have a blue one for recycling, um, paper and stuff like that, and a blue one for scrap steel, mold springs and whatnot. Um, you'll notice I've got this pain in the ass outlet here, uh, where it's got six plugs that plugs into a regular double socket. That's because I have not upgraded this wall yet. That wall over there, where we talked about the plumbing for the washer and the dryer and the sink, I added the sink when I got here, and at the same time I added outlets, which I'll show you in a minute. You want more outlets than you have already. 
and you want it to be easily reachable. So my table here, my suspension table, is deep, so I have room to store stuff I use all the time back there out of the way, and it makes it hard to reach all the way over and plug this in. So when the, when the, the drywall comes off of this wall and I put the AC unit in and more outlets, I'm going to have outlets on here also so I can easily plug in. Next to this, if that's something you don't need, this is a flat stone that's three feet by two feet. It's useful for Lindemann Engineering. Uh, and then I have a rubber mat on top to protect the stone so I can use this as a workstation or a storage shelf when I'm not using it for that. And then underneath, I have a convenient place for my front and rear stands. And I have my vacuum cleaner, which I use all the time. I also have a small battery-powered vacuum cleaner. And I, what I try to do is, let's say I'm drilling a hole on a motorcycle, I've got the vacuum hose in the other hand, and I'm cleaning up my mess as I go. So then you can't get metal shavings stuck in your skin because they fell all over the place and you, and you touched them, and they can't fall into the rest of the motorcycle. All in that category of thinking, keeping things cleaner. Um, and so for that, I have a ratchety extension cord built into the wall here, so I can get that vacuum cleaner anywhere I need. Underneath the workstation, I have some shelves for convenient stuff that I need to get to all of the time. This I'm really proud of. This is my lathe. Again, it's something that you're probably not going to have and you don't need. But you notice that I was talking about a dirty workstation. I took the legs off of my grinder stands and put them underneath the lathe. It does mean I have to kneel down when I want to use that, but I have a pad that I put down on the ground for my knee and I'm keeping all my metal shaving messes in one place. So that's super convenient for me. Uh, and I've got lights all the way along the top, which are going to be fine-tuned a little bit for me, and then shelves on this wall for convenience. Over in this corner, I have the welding table, uh, and I've got an outlet up high, and I've got an outlet underneath for 110. And then I've also got the big outlet for the welder itself. And I did all of that when I had the drywall off and did the plumbing and the, and the welding at the same time. And the way I made this table is I used scrap wood that was around. And then this is a 3 8 or a, yeah, 3 8 thick piece of steel that I had cut to size at the place where I ordered it from and bent like this. So it's vertical on the wall, flat on the tabletop, and vertical down the front and then it's screwed to the wall, and then the table is screwed to the wall and to the floor so that I've got a super solid mount for my vise. The vise goes through the steel tabletop, through the half inch piece of plywood, and then there's a two by four down the center attached to it so that the thing can't move at all because nothing worse than a vise that moves around. Uh, and then I've got my drill press with the easy to reach outlet and my belt sander, which is easy to reach outlet. The drill press came from a Lowe's, and the belt sander came from Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever. These are two really useful tools for any shop to have. You know when you want to make a super bike seat with a neoprene foam and you want those nice smooth edges? You get that on a belt sander. So you can use this for all kinds of stuff. And if you had a choice, grinder or belt sander, get a belt sander. It's more useful than a grinder. And then the drill bit when you go to, uh, sorry, the drill, when you go to pick out the drill you want, take a 1 16th inch drill bit with you and make sure the chuck can hold it because that's the size you want to drill for uh, safety wire stuff. If we head back, oh, go, oh, and the sink, a nice deep sink. If for nothing else, you can clean your hands constantly and keep all the grease and grime off so you're not making the thing you're working on dirty with your dirty fingerprints. If we head back over to the far end again by the solvent tank, you'll see that I've got this smooth, shiny paneling on the wall. And this is the stuff for that's waterproof, you know, it's for paneling in bathrooms. And so I put that up over the drywall where there's going to be oil splash or solvent splash and it doesn't soak into the drywall. And when I'm done here, I'm going to have that stuff all the way down this wall because then the metal shavings that are bouncing up and all, it just won't stick. Um, it just makes for a nice, quick, easy to clean finish. Um, same thing for the floor. Well, when you have the sealed floor, the painted floor, anything you spill on the floor is easy to clean up 
and it doesn't soak into the cement, which then becomes a permanent problem. Tire rack. So you probably have, hopefully have spare wheels for your race bike, uh, and you probably have some old tires that you're keeping or whatever. And there's two good ways to store them. One is to get one of those movers dollies with the casters on the four corners and stack them up on top of each other, big ones on the bottom, and then you can roll that stack around to wherever. But it can be kind of tippy and wobbly and it's not so great. Uh, the best thing is to build a rack that's specific for this task. And the key thing there is that the thing that you're putting, so you put the round wheel onto the shelf and it's resting on two arms. And you want those arms to have a surface area to spread it out. In other words, if you put it onto a point or a narrow thing like the edge of this shelf, it's going to dig into the tire, right? Um, the next best thing is to put some padding over the shelf. So I'm using this as an example. This shelf is the in and the out shelf for Lindemann jobs. So the boxes come in, they get opened up, I save the box, I do the work, I put it back in the box and send it, right? So I've got extra space for that. So you can turn one of these into a wheel shelf. You can get them in different depths by leaving out the rack and covering this with some padding or some kind and then putting your wheels in here. You can do the same on the larger rack that I have over there. Uh, and also a wheel rack, a tire rack is a thing that can go up high. Maybe you build something out of two by fours on the wall. You can buy racks that are ready made that have hinges that hang down. You put the wheels in and then you can put them up when you're, when you're not using it. A lot of options there, but tires and wheels can take up a lot of floor space and getting them up on the shelves uh, is you know, useful if you need to save that floor space. Again, for this layout, you want it. For that layout, you don't need it. In my case, I have a tire rack in the trailer, so in the wintertime, I can store wheels in the trailer, no problem. In the summertime, I, I want to bring them inside the house or inside the shop to protect them from the environment. And nowadays, you go to a track day or a race, and there's going to be a vendor there. So you don't need, generally, to have a bunch of tires in stock. So this may be a thing you can just avoid by good planning and having your tires mounted at the track, leaving the old, worn-out tires with the vendor, and then you don't have to store them. So in conclusion, there are no hard and fast rules. My encouragement is for you to think about your needs and make a plan rather than just throw it together ad havoc. If you're starting from scratch, go for the floor first painting. If you can't paint, carpeting. This 2017 SV650 is the 81st different motorcycle I've raced so far, starting in 1982. Nash is growling at the ball because it's escaped underneath my motorcycle lift. Uh, if you have any questions, you cannot comment on my blog page, on my website, but you can send me an email, ed at le-suspension.com. You can call me, 909-838-4587, and you can post on my Facebook page, Ed Sorbo, uh, where there will be a link for this as well. And bonus points, if you have previously in this video noticed the neat location of my super giant crescent wrenches. Have you seen that before I pointed them out to you? Aloha.